Duncan is uh, uh, a field that's 120 miles uh, east of Aberdeen in the central Graben area. It's operated by Total on behalf of Ace Joint Venture Partners. Um, it consists of a protest utilities forces platform bridge link to um, the Elgin Wellhead platform. You'll we'll see a picture in a, in a minute. It's a high pressure, high temperature field. Uh, so the production field, the original pressure was over a thousand bar, and it was 120 degrees centigrade. So it's the biggest HPHT field developed uh, on the UKCS. It uh, came on stream in 2001, and at the time of the incident was producing the equivalent of 130,000 barrels a day. So a very big production asset. Um, if we're going to get very far on this, you need to understand a little bit on wells, and it's very difficult not to get too technical, but a well is made up of a series of casings. As you drill the well, you drill so far down, and then you case the hole. You then drill further and put another casing in, and drill further another casing. You then put a, a production uh, uh, string in down to the, the main reservoir. The, the production reservoir is called the Fulmer, it's about six kilometers uh, underground. And you've got these various casings going out. And the space between these casings are called an annulus. It's a, it's a gap. It's either filled with liquid or uh, nitrogen. Um, we call these annuluses the A, B, C, and D. This well uh, had been plugged for over a year. It wasn't producing. Um, we had some pressure in the A annulus, so it was waiting uh, to have a plug and abandonment operation. There's a rig on the wellhead platform working on the plug and abandonment of another well at the time. In Fe 25th of February, I mean, the well had been stable, no changes for a year. There was a drop in pressure in the A annulus and a rise in pressure on the B and C annuli. So something had failed down hole. So that alerted us to the fact we needed to intervene as a matter of priority to secure this well. So there was a task force put in place, a program developed, and uh, by mid-March the rig was working on on the well and the, the job was basically to pump oil-based mud, uh, well, non-oil-based mud down the tubing and basically fill the annuli up and get a hydrostatic column of mud throughout the well. During this operation there was a sudden increase in pressure and, uh, and basically failure somewhere and we ended up with a gas leak through what's called the D annulus which is through some ports on the platform right next to the wellhead. Okay. So 12.30 all the gas detectors went off on the wellhead platform. So a significant gas release. So at that point it was clear to the OIMs a significant incident. Uh, you can see this is the wellhead platform. This is the Roman Viking rig with the derrick skidded over the well. And this is the process utilities quarters platform. The bridge is 100 meters long. The temporary refuge is under the heli deck on the PUQ. Clearly the people on the rig are much closer to this incident and uh, at a greater risk. So there were, it was clear to the OIMs they needed to abandon the rig and downman all the non-essential personnel from the, the PUQ. Um, that was organised through the Marine and Coast Guard Agency. Basically two helicopters shuttled people backwards and forwards to adjacent heli decks. So one on sheer water, uh, one on the Rowan Gorilla 5, which was working on the Franklin field at the time get everybody off quickly and then commercial helicopters were used to bring those people to Aberdeen as a second step. 19 people stayed on with the OIM. They were happy, they were safe in the temporary refuge. They were monitoring the pressures in the wells and the annuli. So they were also seeing you know, the gas 
heads, etc. If they totally abandon, you shut all the power off. So you lose all that method of gathering data. We have the same data on shore, but as soon as you lose the power, you lose everything. So the OIM was happy it was safe to be there, and he wanted to see how things evolved. It was pretty clear by early in the morning that this incident wasn't going to stop. You know, this was going to be a long-term incident. There was nothing they could do to stop it. It wasn't sustainable being there. So they agreed, decided they would leave as well and shut all the power off. So we had a good data gathering exercise, which was very helpful for, for the re-intervention. So that's it. That, that's uh, two thirty in the morning. Everybody's off. Um, it's then important to go to the next phase. So what I'm going to talk about for the next ten or fifteen minutes is basically how we engage with the workforce through the following few steps. The next twenty-four hours, the key steps of people, you know, getting the well back under control, reboarding the facilities. We revised the safety case before we restarted production. We've tried to engage with the workforces involved all the way through that process. So, the people who downmanned, everybody was met at the heliport. We set up a reception centre as per our procedures. The HR team met them there. We identified people who were particularly close to the incident or who had potentially in need of support. We identified some key people who had witness statement to tell us what they'd seen, what had happened. Uh, basically, it was to understand if people needed any specialist support. Um, we had meetings between the senior management and the platform management the next day, again as a debrief to allow people to pass all the key information. Um, Everybody was given some money for sundries, um, <coughs> overnight accommodation, onward travel was booked, um, everyone was asked to list their personal belongings, you know, what you left behind, you've not had time to go to your cabin, have you left your keys, your passport, uh, you know, what do you need, uh, that was all, all covered and then make sure everyone got home safely. It's very important that when you have an incident like this, you know, it's Total's normal procedure to have open, transparent communication. You need to be transparent, you need to be open, and you need to communicate effectively with all the stakeholders. If you don't do it, someone else will. So if you want the, the, the truth to be communicated, you've got to make sure it's out there. Um, and that applies over the whole piece. It's not just the press, it's not just the people who are on the site. You've got workers working on other sites operated by Total, you've got contractors on rigs on other site. Everybody needs to know what's happening because everyone's got questions and concerns. So the, ma the managing director made at the beginning daily presentations and the contents of those presentations were diffused to the other sites as well. Um, we set up a dedicated web portal for all the employees uh, and contractors who worked on the Viking and Elgin, even if they weren't involved, if they were off shift, so they could get information about what was happening. You know, there's no point in phoning up saying, do I need to come to the heliport on Thursday for my uh, normal crew change? But they needed to know what was happening. So, so that, was, that was set up. Um, we had dedicated websites. We also used you know, the more modern things like Facebook and Twitter. We made sure we communicated with all the contracting companies that were involved to make sure if they got any questions, we were getting those and we could understand their uh, concerns. Um, we had set up a contractor's representative forum. So again, the one presentation to all the main contract reps to, to efficiently get the messages across. It's very important that we try to deploy everyone to other places of work. If you've just been demobilized from a site, and it's obvious you're not going back in two weeks' time, you're worried about a job. You know, so we made sure that people weren't concerned about their long-term work. 
you know, we looked at how can we de you know, deploy people to other sites and use them. Uh, and that was, you know, very, very important. Uh, we, we had various consultation meetings with all the safety reps, employee reps, and the unions. So the next step was, you know, how do we bring this well under control? There were two things that were progressed: drilling a relief well uh, and bringing in specialist contractors called Wild Well Control to potentially do a top kill. You can only do a top kill if you can actually get on the platform and connect pipes uh, so as you can pump mud into the well. So all of that was driven by, I would say, normal risk management processes. You know, we didn't have a procedure about how do you re, you know, reboard an abandoned platform. But we knew we have a procedure that says, what are the hazards? What can possibly go wrong? How do we control and mitigate those? Perhaps one example is when we first went back with wild well control, we flew by helicopter. So what could, what could go wrong? Well, what happens if on the final approach, this gas that's still leaking out the well ignites? You know, how big a bang could that be? Could that affect the helicopter? So we did those calculations, we spoke to the helicopter manufacturers, uh, what would happen to make sure that effectively it wouldn't affect the, the helicopter and it would be able to safely land. Once the, they got access, and this top photo is our Texan friends on the wellhead platform, uh, they could tell us what they could see. And that then allowed you to firm up your plans. You know, you could then communicate, this is the plan we're doing, you know, this is what we found. Um, so that was used basically to, to be feedback and updates to the staff. We had weekly by this time situation reports uh, shared across all our sites. So we knew we could do the top kill. Uh, Wild Well Control's way of working is effectively to use a mobile unit to bring everything they need to do an intervention. When I say everything, somewhere to sleep, somewhere to eat, somewhere to retreat to if you find something untoward. One of Wild Well Control's procedures is you go forward, you assess. If it's not as you think, you step back and you reassess. And stepping back and reassessing onto a uh, a mobile unit, uh, well away from any of the hazards, a key step there. So we used the West Phoenix, uh, which is a DP3 rig that was drilling for us west of Shetland. Um, we basically you know, brought it down. Uh, it had the pumps we needed, it had the storage capacity for mud. It's used to working on DP. We had to modify the DP arrangement because it's not used to work in DP 20 metres from another installation. There was a bit of training and familiarity with the DP operators for that. We had to make sure the workforce on the West Phoenix were happy to be going down there. You know, you're, you're, you're drilling away merrily west of Shetland and someone says, we want to move the rig next to that platform where there's that gas leak going on. You know, so it's important we engage with the workforce. Again, we did that through the management uh, and directly with the workers. So we, we had a senior management site visit to the West Phoenix before the approach in, into the facilities. And again, used that opportunity to engage with safety reps. Once we killed the well, you've got to then go back onto the platform. So that means you know, you've, you've not been in the temporary refuge for a month. There's no power. God knows what's in the fridge. So, you, you know, what do you need to do to bring these facilities back into use? So, the ops team, although they haven't been working on killing the well, they've been working on how do we get these facilities back in use? What's the order? What do we need to do? What is the specialist contractors we need to help us, such as cleaning companies? That was identified. We then engaged with that workforce say, you know, this is the job you're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, are you happy? Again, through the contract reps and uh, through the safety reps. Once we've got back on, you can clean the facilities, you can start to bring the temporary refuge back into use. The next step is, it's 
that's now usable, so we can sleep there. It's clean. We can feed people. So it's a gradual step. Um, so once you've got people living there, you can then use your normal safety committees, your safety racks, to continue the engagement for the next stage. The gradual build-up in the workforce and bringing various people in to do various jobs as we got full reuse of the facilities. The next step was we got people back on the site, we're working on the well, we're putting cement plugs in, we've got the well the rigs working again. But rig, the Viking had to do exactly the same as the PUQ. You know, their temporary refuge needed to be rehabilitated, their bridges needed cleaning, the wellhead platform itself needed cleaning, it was covered in a waxy Gun, all needs to be cleaned off. The HSE required us to revise and resubmit our safety case before we restarted production to show what the lessons were, what would change, and why it would be safe to restart production. So we looked at the, all the threats to the wells, what had gone wrong, and we've only put three wells back into production, which are the latest generation wells have a, an evolved design compared with the earlier wells. So we've shown those are fit for purpose for, for this situation. We're going to go back and analyse some of the other wells and they may come back into production after further engineering work. But all of this is encapsulated in the safety case. And clearly as part of that process, you consult with your workforce, you consult with your safety reps. You get them involved. While we were doing that, um, you know, the last few weeks before we restarted production, you know, it was important to make sure everyone knew what had changed, what new procedures were in place, how we were going to operate the facilities with less production. Uh, so we were having daily video conferences. People were working two and three. You know, so we spent an hour at the end of every day, effectively doing video conference presentations about this is what's happening. This is what we've changed, so everybody understood how they were going to work when production restarted. Uh, there's a pre, what we call SIMOP, simultaneous operations visit by the senior management. So before, make sure everything's in place before we restart the production. Uh, and of course, whenever we make a senior management visit, we always try and have a meeting with the safety reps to get their feedback. Um, after we restarted production, the managing director made a visit offshore to thank the crews of the Viking and Elgin, both for their you know, professional response in terms of the evacuation, the hard work they'd made in getting the facilities back in use, and to make sure that if they had any concerns, they could ask it. My one story of this is that what, we had a meeting with the safety reps, one of the safety reps for the Royal Viking, he, the first time he'd gone offshore was when the Viking went back into operation to go and clean it up. He was a deck camp, he was a safety rep. And he stuck his hand up and said, I don't know what's going on on Elgin today. The managing director said, you don't know what's going on? But we, you know, there's a daily uh, coordination between the, the PUQ and the Viking and there's information. Clearly, the information wasn't getting down to everybody on the rig. It was absolutely brilliant the safety rep just stick his hand up and make that point. So, as well as the briefings that go went through the line, the managing director said, I want to have a daily situation report you know, on the notice board that everyone's got access to. And he made sure one of the senior managers went back a couple of weeks later to make sure that system was working. So, conclusions. We would not have achieved, uh, you know, what we've achieved in terms of rehabilitating the sites, getting them back up and running again, without the direct involvement, hard work and engagement of the workforce. And some of that workforce that was out there isn't the normal workforce, they might have specialist contractors coming to do cleaning. Everybody who's contributed uh, we, we couldn't achieve this without their contribution. And equally, you've got to listen to what they're saying. 
university, you've got to give them the opportunity to, to raise concerns. Um, so that's, that's my conclusion, is that it's, it was a difficult situation. We tried to engage with the workforce at all levels, um, be it people working on rigs, people in the office, people working on other sites. And uh, I think we generally successfully achieved that. Uh, I was asked uh, at one of the earlier booths, did anyone refuse to go back offshore? And the answer is no. But perhaps we must have done something reasonably effective. So, any questions? The camera's shy. It's, uh, it's very good, it's a fantastic story. I think uh, I'd like to hear maybe some more details on how you engaged with the contractors' workforce. I think that's always a bit of a challenge. You, you're showing pictures of <coughs> town halls with your own MD and so on. But how did you actually get down to the okay, so level like, with the contractors? What, what, what we set up was a series of contractor town hall meetings, a bit like this. Friday afternoon, let's bring in our contractors' representatives, so who are the people who have the you know, contract rep for all the companies that are involved, bring them in, give them a presentation about this is the situation, this is what we're planning to do, um, and then gave them the opportunity to ask questions. And also said, well, you might not have any questions now, but go back to your workforce and you can come back with other questions. You know, we're here to, to help you. So that was the main vehicle, but clearly, you know, where we have a contract rep on our side who's normally dealing with a contract rep on the other side, there was there were you know frequent dialogues there. But we wanted to make sure there was a forum that everyone could be happy together and the contractors, you know, had the opportunity to feed off each other. You, you know, because if you're just in your own little box, you might think, well I I might be a bit concerned about this, but it's not really my area of expertise. If you get everyone together and people ask questions, you can understand a bit more about the, the bigger picture. So that's what we did. And uh, how effective were the contract organisations then to take that information and get it down to their own ranks? Well, I, I think they were pretty effective because we've had very little negative feedback, you know, on the work site from the people who were there. You know, they, you know, because we've not only done it that that way, we've also, you know, been on the site and had town hall meetings to everybody and equally to, to safety reps separately so that you know they're not inhibited from speaking and in both cases we generally had positive comment constructive questions which is what we want so it, it's we think it's worked reasonably well i'm not going to admit everything is perfect you know um, and you can always do more Okay, any other questions? No? Right, go to your next one then.